Um, Michelle Villagran is going to, uh, is our first faculty spotlight um, participant. Michelle, thank you so much for volunteering to go first. This follows on the presentation that Anthony Bernier did at our last meeting, along with Kristen Rebman about, um, you know, research that led us down the garden path and then we got lost and, you know, went somewhere else or, or whatever. And it led us to talking about our journey as scholars and how every person has a different story and it is part of the formative process of other scholars. So Michelle volunteered, we, we decided this would be a great feature for each one of our cohort meetings and Michelle volunteered to be the first to do that. So I'm very excited. I'm I'm very happy that you are presenting to us tonight. So, so please go ahead and um, tell us about yourself. Well, thank you, Mary. I feel after I volunteered, I shouldn't have because when I started putting this together, I don't know, I started questioning lots of things about my own journey. So it was like a <laughs> self-exploration. Um, and the presentation is going to be a little different than my typical, as many of you have seen how I present. I think this is more tips. And from my experience, what worked, what didn't work, where I still have my own fears, we'll say, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't know, it was this fun to do, but I, I'm still questioning a lot of things. Anyway, so let me yeah. share my screen. Uh, oh, I cannot, it says host disabled. Can you give me, let's see. Oh, did it work? Mary, I think I think you need to give Michelle sharing privileges. Hmm. I'm let not me sure try if Mary it. heard you. Let me try it again. No, I should be able to. Looks like I can share now. Now I can. I just want to hide myself and all of you. Put you over here. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep. Looks great. Okay. So, one, um, Letty, I want to say thank you for your presentation because um, I'm, I did a little piece of that in a recent T3 for um, our faculty and especially in Canvas and how important accessibility is. So, I really appreciate you sharing all of that. And I just learned quite a bit from you that I didn't even know. So, thank you. Cool. Um, so, when I was putting this together, the whole term scholar was fumbling me all up, to be quite honest. And I had to go do my own hunting for, well, what is a scholar? When did I become a scholar? Who is a scholar? Where does it start? And as I'm sure many of you know, definition wise, I wrote down three different definitions that kept coming up as I was looking at literature. So a person who pursues academic and intellectual um, activities a specialist in a particular area, a learned person with a profound knowledge in a specific subject area. So as a student, you are a learner, you're learning. And as a scholar, you are learned in a specific area. Now, I don't know that in my head, I, I necessarily agree with that because I know there's a distinction between student and scholar, but I've been a lifelong student and I feel I'm still a lifelong student, even though I'm not pursuing another academic credential, but I'm still constantly learning. So I was really struggling with the scholar term um, when I started putting this together. And I thought I would separate it into kind of the past, the present and the future uh, to frame it. So in the past, and I don't know why I said, again, difficult decision. It's not like I had these, like, you know, I have to make this big decision. But I think we all, and I'm talking about with the term scholar here, but I think we all start somewhere. So, and I'll talk about which I think are the two points in my life where I felt that I was a, I would say a scholar in the sense of an academic research scholar or scholarly, producing scholarly works. Um, so where was that start? Again, I mentioned the lifelong student. So I'm still learning. I feel like I'm a student, even in my profession, continually staying on top of my area of expertise. But because I'm that student, am I not a scholar then? Okay, so am I scholarly yet? This is where I'm like going down this scholarly hunt. Um, and how in the past I have pivoted 
quite a bit, as you'll see. Uh, so to give you some context in my background, I was a practitioner for a while. I worked 10 years in the public library. So I was a public library and that was my first job was in a, a public library. Um, I say that they, uh, I blame them, actually I thank them, I don't blame them, but I really thank them for uh, then introducing me to, you could get a degree and become a librarian, a professional librarian. Um, and I was really interested in law. So I actually wanted to go to law school. I took the LSAT twice. I was going down the legal track until I learned about law librarianship. So I did a pivot, still practitioner into the law library space. I uh, worked in law firms, but then I also worked for a legal vendor, which was a pivot. I was seen as going to the dark side, which Letty might understand working, you know, with vendors and publishers <laughs> right yeah yes. so <laughs> even though you know but then you're not on the dark side it's like it's all of the fun world that you didn't even know about um and then I was doing a lot of consulting both uh it, I ended up working for a I was a director of recruiting and doing needs assessments for libraries a lot of fun work and then um got laid off twice in my life and in one of those laid off, layoff times, I didn't have a job and I decided to start my own consulting firm, Cultural Co., which I still today have and still do some consulting work around cultural competence, cultural awareness, cultural values, diversity, equity, and inclusion, emotional intelligence, and dispute resolution, which all are from my past and have kind of threaded together into my consulting work. And then the academic world kind of it came to me. I didn't necessarily go to it. Uh, so I didn't know I necessarily land in an academic uh, tenure track position where, of course, uh, RISCA, our, our, our research and scholarly production is very important. Uh, but along the way in my past, um, I really believed and this is maybe because I have more of the corporate mindset and I was a practitioner and doing consulting that I needed to get some real expertise behind the topics that I was researching and I was interested in. So my dissertation was on cultural intelligence. I first learned of the term in 2008. I ended up getting level one, level two and advanced certifications all on cultural intelligence and now teach a course on cultural competence and cultural intelligence is a big piece of that course in the iSchool. Um, and that's stuck with me since, since I've learned of the term and I apply it like every day. Same with dispute resolution or conflict management. Here's a pivot. I was working on my dissertation and I decided, well, why don't I just go get a certificate? You could get a, this is at Pepperdine, you could get a certificate in uh, dispute resolution. It was a joint degree with your doctorate. So I said, okay, let me do that. So then I had a certificate in dispute resolution and it was only, I think four or five more classes, but then, hey, why not go get a ma another master's? Let's just take a little break, take a year off and go get a master's of dispute resolution. So I was here pivoting back to my interest in law, right? Even though I was working in libraries, still love the law. Still working on my dissertation around cultural intelligence and law libraries. So I was trying to make this little niche area and pull it all together, but I had to pivot. I took time off away from my dissertation. And then I got married because you know, life happens and things happen when you're progressing through life. But I never wanted to lose sight of the cultural piece, which actually ties significantly into a diverse and equity and inclusion work. Uh, and so I, said, I need to really get certified in these areas. And then I ended up getting certified in uh, EDI as well. So that's a little bit about kind of the past. Uh, practitioner oriented, um, not really producing scholarly works, if you will, or as we think of it in, um, I would say in academia. But I had this like epiphany that I am a scholar now, not now, but I had this epiphany that when I was putting this presentation together that I have the expertise and I've had it for quite some time in some of these areas, the cultural intelligence. I first got certified in 2011, long before I finished my dissertation in 2015. 
or at, and yeah, my doctorate. So, okay, I felt that I was a scholar probably then leading down that path because I'm pursuing these intellectual um, activities related to the cultural intelligence and really building up my area of study. And of course, along the way, there's imposter syndrome and you get scared and then being a faculty of color and even just a person of color before becoming faculty, am I going to be accepted? Um, you know, all these things, right? We're flowing and still even do sometimes today are in my mind and impact the, uh, I would say the journey to still being a scholarly um, academic. So let me give you an example of kind of past to present. I did a lot and I still do a lot of presenting. I've enjoyed presenting. Um, my presentation is really well attended. I've just really enjoy presenting and I focused a lot when I worked for Thomson Reuters. I focused a lot and learned a lot from them about putting um, presentation techniques, um, tactics, a lot of things you might learn in Toastmasters, uh, but really applying those. And I had never thought about taking a presentation and then turning it into a publication or into a piece of work that later, later on someone would read. I had never thought of that. I'm here presenting at conferences. But the conferences I was presenting at were primarily practitioner-oriented conferences. They were not conferences that I would consider are scholarly or academic uh, types of conferences. And then through my consulting, I have several case studies that could be published. They haven't been published. So this is another area. This is kind of my future work. Uh, but I never thought about it at the time when I was doing this work. And then the connections, I've made a ton of connections, right? You go to conferences and network and um, all of the connections you make. So these could be your future collaborators or your future partners uh, on a publication or your support network. So I didn't really have this grand plan. Nothing was planned. There was no plan, not planned at all. Um, and not a part really of my, my plan. I wasn't planning to go into academia where I would have to then be required to publish and do a lot of scholarly production. Now I would say though, maybe not so much in the public library, but when I was, even when I was working with Thompson, so when I was on the legal vendor side and uh, the consulting work, there was a lot of research that was involved and a lot of reports that came out of it, or even um, internal, a lot of it was internal or maybe for clients. So there was a lot of scholarly production, but at a different uh, level, I would say, or just a different, differing audience, of course. So while, and here's my little catch all at the bottom, while to me, research and writing was never my focus, it was actually embedded in pretty much everything I was doing, but I didn't really realize it and connect the dots until I landed in academia. So my to-do list, and this is kind of fast forwarding a little further because now we're talking about present day. Um, when I did fall into academia, it was actually in 2009. Um, I was in a part-time position as a coordinator, really doing recruitment. Um, I didn't start teaching until 2013 um, at a face-to-face -face program in Burbank at Woodbury University in their conflict management. Um, it was a Master of Arts. Uh, but I taught conflict management and it was to all law enforcement uh, students. So those working in law enforcement agencies. And once I came into a tenure track, which was 2018, I had to do a significant, I would say mind shift where my mindset had to change. I was very practitioner oriented, even teacher oriented, if you will, even though, um, still a teacher now, right? Uh, and then consultant oriented, but I had to think more like an academic scholar. And it took, it's almost like, you can't just flip the switch, but it took practice and I'm still practicing and working on it. Uh, but I think that's where finding um, writing groups, uh, writing strategies, support networks have really helped. Uh, I have a one hour slot every day that I dedicate to my research and scholarly production. And that could be outlining something that could be um, 
during a revision and revise and resubmit, I just had a journal, actually an article that got accepted to the Journal of Academic Librarianship. So I don't know when it'll be out, but it just got accepted last week. Uh, and all of these things, because of the time I've committed, are moving forward. And even with conferences and um, organizations, I think it's really important to stay connected with those, we'll say, practitioner-oriented um, associations. We'll use ALA as an example. For me, that one's, to me, it's more the practitioners in the field. And it's important to stay connected and be a part of those when you can. But if it's between that and, say, a lease or, say, another scholarly conference, I would feel where I could present my research and then out of it might come a publication, I probably would um, lend more towards um, Elise. So I have shifted my conferences, my association memberships um, that I'm a member of uh, to be in the space I need to be in now. But also I say leverage, so dual outcomes. Uh, I got asked to keynote, uh, was it two years ago? for Pennsylvania Library Association for their conference and also Minnesota Library Association. I keynoted, keynoted both of them, but out of them, Pennsylvania, they actually have a peer reviewed journal. And I did some researching, found their journal and was able to take pretty much my keynote. And then I did a whole survey, produced that into a publication in their um, peer reviewed journal. So when I say dual outcomes, really leveraging if you do present somewhere or whatever it is, make it a, a twofer. So you get two things out of it, not just one. And find those partners and collaborators. So uh, Anthony, um, I know you're here. Uh, Anthony and I are working together on first generation work, uh, first generation students uh, work as well as uh, submitted a grant together. Um, Dara, I don't know if Dara is here, but her and I are continuing to collaborate. We have another grant we're submitting, I think two more we're working on. So if you can find those partners or collaborators, it's almost like find your people. I don't know how to say it better than find those where you have a vested interest. It aligns with your scholarly um, area of expertise. And it may be, you might think this is not my area at all, but maybe it is. It might be a slice of it, or it might be an addition. And you might need to then sell it to that person that say, no, I can bring this contribution. So again, what can you co contribute? And continue to learn. Um, bumps in the road. Oh my, yes. Uh, <laughs> this is where you got to take a breather. Again, it's the, you know, we never know what life might give us, right? Or what might could happen. And you might have to take a break or just take that breather. Um, never say never. So, I was on the beach with my best friend who is a, uh, she's, uh, was a former chair and she's still at uh, Cal State Northridge. And we were there and she's been in academia for a long time. And I told her, cause we're talking about tenure track and, you know, going to academia. And I said, I will never, never uh, go into academia in a tenure track position. And here I am. So never say never, because it will happen. Um, and it just, I just had to pivot, I think, with, with where I wanted to go and actually fits very well in what I want to do and what I'm currently doing. Look at your supports again. I mentioned your support networks, your resources, your connections, all of those, your students, your peers, or those in your cohort, your professors, your supervisors. Um, Keep in contact with them and foster those relationships. So don't just say, well, we'll stay connected and then you don't water that relationship so it can continue to grow. And do learn when, no, learn when to say no. I'm still struggling, but I am saying no. And there's a nice little meme that's floating around about November. And November is the month to say no, because you don't want those individuals to steal your I think it's about, that one's about joy and enjoyment, but I'm going to say you don't want them to steal away your precious time you need to uh, do your research. And these are the two, I think, pivotal points where I was like, I am a scholar. I am a research scholar. In 2018, um, I don't know if it was, in, it might have been 2017, I presented at the International Association of School Libraries uh, Conference, Practitioner-Oriented Conference. Not my area, I'm not a school librarian, 
But uh, Leslie Farmer, Dr. Farmer, who's at Cal State Long Beach, came to my session and then she said, why don't you write a piece for, for our, uh, the School Library Association, their journal, their knowledge quest. So that really, it, to me, was my first peer review. It was editorial peer reviewed publication. And three years earlier, uh, thanks to my former mentor, rest in peace, Dr. Chandler, she pulled me in into a book project. It started in 2015. Um, it got published fall 2018. I wrote two of the chapters. I did the survey with her, um, but we really looked at um, diversity within the American Association of Law Libraries and about minority leadership. And we conducted interviews and it was a big project, but that's where I really got integrated, I would say, into the scholarly world and can never thank her enough. So persevere, I am a scholar and you are too. And lastly, I have just two more slides, I believe. Important things, I feel like a pep talk for myself too. You can do this, we can all do this. Um, some projects will die, I remember Anthony, um, at your presentation, you mentioning, you know, some things do die or you don't go that route. It happens. But could you bring it back from the dead? Could you resurrect it in a way that maybe it's incorporated in a different way? Maybe it's not that journal publication. Maybe it's a speaking engagement, but then you're pulling in one of your peers or even a student and then you're going to submit a grant or you need a partner on the grant, but the topic is from the project that died. I have one right now that's dying and I'm trying to keep it going. Uh, but the initial intent, I would say, of this prize is going to be a journal article around um, racial diversity in law libraries. I think we're going to take a different approach and um, it's going to be split into two different projects because one, there's the racial um, diversity, but there's so much more to diversity. So looking at neurodiversity and other um, aspects within law libraries, not just focusing on racial diversity. So it might end up being two projects. And there's other opportunities. I mentioned grants. So that's another way to really um, build up your scholarly. And it could be a small seed grant and then just grow larger and larger and going beyond the local. So don't just look for local friends, local partners, local collabor collaborators, but look beyond. Look states away, virtually away, internationally, and leveraging it all. So my last slide, and this isn't really, I don't know if it's future, but it's taking charge of your own journey. We each have a different journey. So a lot of the things today might not even resonate. Some might, all of it might. But thinking about, well, who am I? Who do I wanna be? Uh, and this is almost like set up those goals, those smart goals. Who do I want my contribution? What do I want my contribution to be? What, why is what I'm researching important? How can I get there? Where do I want to make that impact? And I say it's the continuous journey. Some of you know I'm a runner. So lately, you know, I did I did one run this month. I did San Jose um, in October, but because of COVID, I was not doing any virtual runs. I was running on my own. But it's you know not just a marathon. It's actually more of a triathlon because you do have to pivot and it's not just one sport. It might involve three or even more. So 2008, that was my first marathon in Vegas. That's the bottom photo. I don't know the top photo. It was from somewhere. And that, the You Are Amazing, was from the LA Marathon, I think eight years ago. It happened yesterday, but I did not run it. I cheered for people. But a woman had that sign and it just wants... I want to share it here to tell all of the students that you are amazing and to take charge of your, your scholarly journey. So that's it. Questions? Thank you so much, Michelle. That was, that was wonderful. Um, um, whatever feelings you might have had about having agreed to do it, um, uh, I think that that was just great. And I feel like over the months when we do this and when other faculty um, tell their stories, they're all going to be different. And yet we see these threads that run through them. 
um, you know, the never say never, the unexpected opportunities, the twists and turns, the pivots and so on. So that that that's wonderful. Are there questions or comments for Michelle? Well, Mary, I didn't want it to sound negative, but I do thank you for um, allowing me to volunteer and be the first one. It Absolutely. Just, just oh, I appreciate me. it so much. We I appreciate learned so it. much. It, we it appreciate just, it very much. It yeah, made yeah, me, yeah. Uh, I don't know, I, it was like my own little self-exploration and it, right. just, it just felt good, but it also made me, I have all these questions now. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I see a lot of comments. Thank you, Letty. I was going to say, yeah, it's just encouraging to hear that, you know, you're always processing. You're always, you know, recasting your sense of yourself and the value you can bring and, and that we're not alone. You know, I think a lot of us, you know, on the, you know, kind of student and candidate side, you know, we're in these transitions, you know, in different, you know, thresholds. And um, I don't think that ever ends. Right. So it's just very encouraging to to hear your reflections on your own journey. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I want to thank you too, Michelle. Um, I do know that it's not easy just to rack, re-rack the balls for one brief presentation that contains your journey. So uh, it's a, it's, it's great to do that. I, I remember when I was a, applying to, uh, to, to get the position at San Jose State, Dr. Bill Fisher asked me a particularly provocative question during the interview. Um, I was a practitioner at the time. I was doing talks and I was uh, publishing my little opinions from the field. And uh, I wouldn't say puffed up about myself, but I knew what I was doing as a practitioner. Uh, Bill's question just, just uh, came like a shot out of the blue just to kind of uh, slap me into uh, awareness. He said, he asked, why do you want to change careers. I saw it, or I was pretending to see it as a, well, it's just another part of the field, but it's not. Being a practitioner, being invited to give talks, giving workshops, being referred to, yada, yada, is all very fun. It's very ego boosting and all of that. But then when you start as a scholar, you start with the scholarship. You start at the beginning. You have to develop methods. You have to create and analyze data and you have to synthesize that data within the broader scholarship in which you're entering. So you're starting over. Mm -hmm. And um, eight I think a lot of us, I think a lot of us have that when we come out of the field, librarians in libraries, libraries, uh, library faculty tend to come from the field the way Michelle did, the way I did, but we do have to pivot as she said. And it's sometimes not easy to do to give up all of those, those accolades that we were getting. But uh, it's, it's necessary if we're going to be successful as an academic scholar. If you're going to stay in practice, that's different. But if you're going to come in and be a scholar, you've got to change gears. And it's not easy. Yeah, I, Anthony, I just want to say it. Um, and I think it, it, it's not for everyone, too. Like, I, it's actually, it's worked out fine for me. And I'm very happy that I said, never say never. I said no. And, here, and then here I am. And it, I've been nothing but happy with it. Um, but it is a, a, a shift. It is a, a very different shift. It's almost like going to the dark side in the way, like going to a vendor. It's a whole shift. It's just very different. And it is important. You know, we may look back on our journey as students, you know, to the point where we entered a PhD program and have successfully completed that. And the things you described about your certifications, your other master's degree, and so on, that, that's very interesting, the, the sort of opportunities that come up and the, the way it all weaves together then to, to be part of your journey. But also, it's so important for our minds to be open to the fact that it's like, okay, I'm really good at being a librarian, I believe. You know, however, that, that doesn't mean it's, it, that doesn't, mean that that's just the same then when I, you know, when I enter this new field or this new part of the field, it's going to be exactly the same. And I am stubbornly going to cling to that, you know, um, that it's so important to, you know, to open our eyes to what we're being shown and told. Um, I agree with that. I have one last thought with that is that 
it's almost like doing your own skills assessment in a way. Like when I was putting this together, I had to think back, well, what were the things that now I really, I have like built this little niche, niche area of my expertise in certain areas. And so there might be things for all of you, um, all of you students there that you can then pull that in. Don't just let it go because I think it adds, it adds value, even if you might not see it and where it might be in the future, but it's a piece. It'll be a piece of that, that future position. <laughs>